I mean, it had to be a real mental challenge to go from, you know, a, a big fish in a small pond in South Dakota to play, you know, major high level college golf. What was that like? And what, what kind of would go through your brain or, or was it easier than you might think? Welcome back to the Player Pursuits podcast. I'm your host, Alex Shattuck. Today we have a guest on that is an LPGA Epson Tour player. Um, it's going to be kind of determined in the next couple of weeks as she prepares for Q School. Kim Kaufman, welcome. Uh, welcome on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, so Kim is preparing for... I believe it, what is it still Q series final stage? They yeah. keep changing it up. Yeah, either or Q series final stage. Um, they've changed a bit this year. So Q series was really when they did um, they did two back to back weeks essentially, and it was eight cumulative rounds. Um, this year they have turned it back a little bit, and we're just doing six rounds, six consecutive rounds in one site. So um, a little bit different, but obviously saves a little bit of cost. And I think eight was maybe probably a little too much. Like you're going to get the same result probably from six rounds as eight rounds. Um, so yeah, Q series, final stage, all of the above. <laughs> all right. And so for those who don't know, Q school is sort of like the world's hardest, longest, most expensive job interview yeah. <laughs> on, on earth. So can you tell us a little bit about what that entails and also how you know where you start. There's first stage, second stage on the men's side, there's pre-qualifying. How does that work? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to explain and to, and to you know, to grapple with, but I, I, I do explain it a lot to people. So uh, on the LPGA side, we have three, just three stages. Um, first stage was in August, and that is gonna be, you know, anyone out of college, anyone who just says, I'm gonna go to Q school, just turn pro. And that has played the Epson tour and is outside the top 125 at that point. That's pretty much who's gonna be in a first stage. So they did that. Um, about 100 girls make it out of there and go to second stage. And joining them at second stage is um, anyone on the LPGA list who is outside the top 150, um, anyone on Epson who's going to be outside the top 35 at the end of the year if, if they think they're going to be, and um, and then a, a few other ones. Like certain people maybe in world ranking might get in. Some girls from like um, a mini tour we partner with gets in. So. There's a few other people that will come join you there, but that's second stage. And that's generally seen as the, the most difficult stage. You have about 200 people for 40 spots, just numbers wise. It's, it's not a huge cut that make it out. So those 40 now, which I was one of those now come to final stage. And we join girls that were on the LPJ that finished 101 to 150. Um, and also probably, I think maybe top 75 in the world, any of those girls from maybe the JLPGA or the, the KLPGA that want to come. So um, you'll get a few others like that, but that's generally what it is. So we have about 120 at final stage and 45 in ties will get LPGA status. Okay. And where, where is that this year? It keeps moving we, around. Yeah. We had a Pinehurst for a few years and we struggled with daylight and, and just like frost in the morning. So now we're in Mobile, Alabama, um, on the RTJ trail, you know, two courses there with the daylight you need, you need, even with only 120 players, you need two courses. So um, I played there last year. They're, they're great golf courses. They're fantastic places to host. You know, they, they know what they're doing. We actually hosted an LPGA event there my rookie year at one of those courses. So um, it's a good venue. Can we get some cold, bad weather? Yeah, we, we probably can. But for the most part, you are getting pretty close to Florida. So fingers crossed that we'll, you know, be okay. You know, everyone, I mean, everyone plays the same weather, but you, you don't want it to be like 34 and you're teeing off for anyone. So um, that's probably the biggest the biggest you know problem being there but so far it's it's been okay so when you're going into an event like this how does your approach change you're kind of a seasoned vet you spent many full years on the lpga tour you you've kind of done it all how are you approaching going into this event and what is maybe a day of practice look like knowing that you're going to final stage here in what a week week and a half yeah, so uh, my practice has really been, I mean, like there's things we came back in the second stage, which was a little over a month ago. So we had a, a significant amount of time here and there's a few things we really wanted to do. Like I changed my grip for my putting a little bit, um, like a little bit of my driver, like some things we really want to work on. But overall, it's just doing a little bit of everything every day, which for me, it's always five areas. It's chipping, bunker, putting, wedges, full swing. And I'm going to do a little bit of that every day. And then I'm probably going to play as well. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to be at a, a a golf course here where like, I mean, I put 18 holes stay in two hours. I was the only person out there. So 
which really helps as well. But, and then also, you know, just setting up matches with other pros that are playing. There's another girl at my club that's going to go and guys that are going. So, but really like are all five things sharp every day and every day doesn't feel as sharp, but just, just keeping it fresh. Um, but as far as the mindset, that is something that has probably changed over my 10 years as you grow and mature and, and see a little more. And I think the mindset is really, I talked to my mental coach about this, you know, weeks ago, I said, it's a great opportunity, but you also know it's not the only opportunity. It's just like part of the journey, but that's a hard place to get to. If you're young, you're just coming out or you maybe don't have status anywhere, which at final stage, you're going to have status in Epsom. So everyone truly has somewhere to play next year, but it's easy to think like, this is it. This is my only chance. But if you really believe in yourself or in a good mental space, you know, I can be as prepared as I am. I can be like, you know, maybe the feel like I'm the best player out there, but I might get food poisoning or I might just like not make a putt and not make it. But if I know I'm a good player, I believe in myself, I will get there, whether it's through Q school this year or through the Epson tour next year or playing an LPJ event next year that I reshuffle. Um, it's just part of the journey. I would say it's an opportunity. It's not the only opportunity. And that's really where I have definitely changed in the last 10 years to get to that place. I don't think you could have put it any better. And I'm sure that you know, current you would love to tell that to a, <laughs> a, a rookie Kim, um, yeah. although you did have quite a bit of success uh, pretty early yeah. as well. well. I was I was lucky. I was lucky in that aspect that I didn't have to do that. But I look at so many girls and I think, gosh, just, you know, girls that are great players, but just kind of almost sabotage themselves because they think it's the only opportunity. They think it's the end of the world to maybe, maybe you came out as the, the number one am in the world and you had to go play Epson. Like, it's okay. The tour will be there and the tour will just, just keeps getting better. So, um, yeah, I, I, I do, I hope everyone, I, I wish I could tell everyone that, but it's hard. Sometimes you have to just live through it and get there yourself. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to take one short break and we'll be back to kind of talk about, um, the way you came up. We'll go deeper into that and your career and what you're looking forward to. The game of golf. It's both challenging and rewarding, requiring focus, concentration, and the ability to tune out outside distractions. Peak performance is achieved through a synergy of body and mind. Shell Golf Apparel is designed with advanced textile technology that moves with you, with four-way stretch and moisture-wicking properties that keep you cool and dry. Visit shell.shop today and get 40% off the entire golf collection using promo code PLAYERPURSUITS. Now, back to the podcast with your host, Alex Shattuck. All right, we are back with Kim Kaufman. Now, one of the um, kind of funny things about having you on the pod is that we are both from South Dakota. I met Kim for the first time, I think I was like 12 or 13, and, and she's actually the one that taught me Aimpoint. Um, you know, <laughs> me, just a middle school dweeb and Kim, you know, one of the top collegiate players in the country. But Kim grew up, um, you know, from from a smaller town in South Dakota, very different upbringing from a lot of girls that make it to the top level or even make it to the top level of college golf. Um, so, Kim, tell us about a little bit where you're from and what your junior golf career looked like. And maybe I can put that in perspective for the listener. Yeah, I mean, I get asked about that a lot. Um, people, you know, learn I'm from South Dakota and they think, gosh, like, you know, do you even play golf up there? And I say, you know, we love our golf. It's just not a very long season. So um, for me, I grew up in Florida, South Dakota, which is a population of 1,200 people, um, just a little farm town. But I was, you know, I say we had a nine hole golf course, which is all we needed. Um, my dad thought he was going to play golf. He was probably early 30s, but instead, my sister and I really played golf instead we loved it I was four years old and Ashley was six and uh, that's just what we did we just loved to play um Ashley went and played a tournament when she was probably seven years old and came back with this medal and I was like I need one of those so at five years old I played my first tournament um, I was obviously very mature as a kid um and just competitive I just loved it like you said and we just for us, we played all summer. We played that downhill golf course a million times and we would play the little South Dakota junior tour, which was fantastic for us. And for years and years, I finished fast every time because I was playing with these 11 and under kids like my sister, but I didn't, I didn't care. I loved it. So, um, as we got a little bit older, we would try for any, you know, USJ event, the, the girls junior, the public or the AM. And if I qualified for one of those, that's where we would take a trip. But other than that, we didn't play an AJJ. I didn't, I didn't really play much of anything else. Maybe a little bit in Minnesota, but 
Um, you know, it's a short summer and thankfully we had a really good junior tour that we could compete on. And then, you know, as I got older, I, I usually did qualify for something so I could go out, you know, nationally and kind of series stack up because you can become in a little bit of a little shelter just playing in South Dakota, you know, there's, there's a lot more out there. Um, and, and that was it. And, you know, we didn't, we didn't really know any different, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't think like, oh, these other girls in Florida are playing year round and getting better. Like, I mean, obviously I, I realized Florida didn't have winter, but it just, to me, it was just normal. Like you put your kind of put your clubs away. We'd hit in a net in the winter, but that's fine. We never, never once took a trip South. Never. I've never once had played in December until I went to college and, and, you know, that's what was kind of funny is I thought I'm going to go play summer and play year round. So I went to Texas tech, but that very first, we finished about the first of November. And I was like, whoo, like my body clock was kind of like, we got to put the clubs away. And my teammates are like, you know, are we going to go play? And I'm like, go play. Like, what do you mean? Like, I'm going to have a tournament till January. Like, so that took me a little while. It took me a little while to kind of have like almost the stamina to, to practice year round and, or not stamina, but even just mentally not to need that break. But um, yeah, I mean, like I say, I, I love growing up there. I thought it was fantastic. It, it gave me a ton of opportunities. Um, and I, I didn't know any different. Just the, I mean, it had to be a real mental challenge to go from, you know, a, a big fish in a small pond in South Dakota to play, you know, major high level college golf. What was that like? And what, what kind of would go through your brain? Or, or was it easier than you might think? No, you are right in that. Like, I, I really wanted to go to like a big school. I wanted to experience all of that to go to a big city. Um, so I went to Lubbock, which in Texas, they're like, oh, that's not. But I was like, oh, this is great. Like, there's a movie theater. It's, you know, it's it's 250,000 people, but people kind of make fun of that in Texas, which is funny. So, um, yes, I was you know, obviously very confident in South Dakota. I was definitely the big fish in a small pond. And when I went to Tech, I, I vividly remember I had you know, I had two teammates from the Philippines and a couple of girls from Texas and a girl from California. And I thought, oh gosh, like they're, they're obviously great. They're from Asia and they're worth a fill. You know, they're going to make it. And I remember that first qualifier, you know, to my coach and he's like, Kim, like you're good enough. Like you'll make it. But I, I, I did feel a little insecure. I didn't, didn't have the confidence I did at home for sure. And I, but I won that first qualifier and I qualified. And that I think was so big for me just to prove to myself, like, okay, I can do this too. Like, just because they're from the world doesn't necessarily mean they're that much better than you. And um, so that was probably fortunate. If I wouldn't have maybe made that first, I probably would have gone. I may have lost my confidence. It might've been a little bit, a little bit hard, but thankfully I, I played well and I kind of proved it to myself pretty quickly, but yeah, it was, it was a bit of an adjustment. Yeah. And, and Kim very much will, will downplay her college career, but I, I was a high schooler just keeping up with, you know, old friends and names I knew. I went on Golf Week and she's the number one college player in the country. And um, that is beyond impressive. I just had a college golf coach on the last episode. We talked for quite a bit how challenging college golf is. You're playing during the, the worst months of the year. You're a full-time student. You're traveling courses you've never seen before, hard courses you've never seen before, playing against... Um, you know, a, a proven ground that has most of the best, you know, 20 year olds in the world. Um, and, and so that is um, a crazy impressive thing. And how did that prepare you for when you turned pro? A lot of times in the women's game now, um, it doesn't seem like a lot of the girls stick around for four years of college or, or even go to college. Yeah, it is a little different on our side. You know, difference in I think just male and females and girls maturing so much earlier and they will they'll go I mean you know Rose Zhang went to a couple of years which was great but could it easily came out at 17 Ellie Corda came out at 18 I mean it's just, it's just different but I, I actually would say out of those I well one I, four years in college definitely was not ready to come out um but I probably was a little more confident going from college to tour than I was from South Dakota to college so um, like you say, those things like, you know, being ranked number one for a while and, and being an all American, going to nationals, like you just seeing that over and over builds your confidence. We talk about my mental coach and I talk a lot about confidence is, is just proven evidence, seeing proof and evidence just builds confidence. It's, it's, it's truly like, you know, a plus and minus game. So it helped a ton. It helped a ton. I went out to, and I went out on tour and I, once again, I was pretty naive. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I could play good golf. And, um, you know, we just kind of hit the ground running when I, when I turned professional.
So when you first turned pro, you you were on the what was the Symmetra Tour is now the Epson Tour. For those who maybe don't know, it's like the um, the Corn Ferry Tour on the women's side, the tour right yeah. under the LPGA. Um, and that tour has grown tremendously. If you ever get the chance to go watch, go do it. It's a blast. The girls are amazing. And you're watching the girls that will be on tour next year. So Kim, what yeah. was your first yeah. year on, on that tour like? Um, I, I, if I recall correctly, you had a pretty good season. I did. It, it was, um, that's probably, like, that's a great story, really. I, when I graduated college, there was at the time on, on the Symmetra tour, what was called an A5 exemption. And that meant if you were at the end of December, that previous year, the top five players in the college golf rankings could come directly out and play the Symmetra tour. So I was one of those five. So um, I did that. And at the time there was 15 events in the tour and there was 10 events left. So I go out there, um, play my first event. I think I finished T10 play my second event. And then I go to play my third event, which was my first one on my own really it was in the UP in Michigan. And I was a little bit homesick. I did. I wasn't allowed. I was staying in housing for the first time, you know, driving up, knocking on a stranger's door. Like, what am I doing here? And we're playing along. We're playing on Sunday. My, my host dad said, you want me to caddy? Like I, he, I think he had caddy for a really to cut. And I said, okay. And we're, we're, we're playing fine, but nothing crazy. And it was a really windy day. And I shoot five under and I win that event. And I thought I want, I think I won $17,000, which I thought was like, million dollars like I thought I'm set for life this is great great um there on out like I say I was lucky I also I had a fast start there which I look back now and realize how lucky that was but at the time I didn't probably realize it just financially having a little bit of money which no 17 that's not a lot but when you're just driving your car on playing the Epson tour that is quite a lot of money um so we finished the year on I'm in the top 10 and I'm starting to feel like oh my gosh like could I get an LPJ tour card and I'm feeling it a bit and we go to the last event Daytona Beach and I don't remember if I missed the cut or I made the cut and finished like dead last. And I dropped out. Like I finished like 12 and I thought it was the end of the world. Oh, so, last event, Daytona beach. Okay. So I go to, I go to Daytona beach and I, I mean, I was so nervous. Like I, I totally choked. And I don't remember if I missed the cut or if I just made the cut and finished dead last, but made like $300 and, and dropped out the top 10, which I thought was the end of the world. Like I was saying like, once again, I thought it was, you know, the only opportunity. So I go straight to the final stage and back then one through 20 got like a full card, like no reshuffle and 21 through 45 was conditional. I am not lying. When I say back then, I didn't, I didn't know what conditional even meant. I had no <laughs> clue. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what a reshuffle was. I didn't know anything. So I go and I play my first round, I should be like 75, like not, not great. Um, but it's five rounds. So over four more rounds, I kind of chip away at it. And I finished 21st. And once again, I'm just like, you, you've got to be kidding me. Like, how am I, how am I out? Just one again. So I, in my opinion, I'm like, great. I'm, I'll just play the Aaron Epson again. I do not know what this conditional status means. I think I've lost my card. So I go and I start the Epson season and I win like the second event. So I'm like leading the money list. And I'm like, if you know me, I'm a planner. I'm like, okay, I am just going to stand the Epson tour. Like I'm going to, you know, I have to stay here. And my agent calls me and says, Kim, you got into Dallas. And I'm like, okay, but I don't really want to go because there's an Epson tour event at the same time, but I'm like a little too afraid to tell him. I don't really know how to do this. So I go and you probably know this, but I, you know, I finished fourth in that event and therefore I learned what a reshuffle is a reshuffle next week. And I reshuffled up and, and then I played the OJ tour for the next seven years. Well, let's, so let's let's say like a, an mean. opportunity versus just, you know, it's not the only one, like you just play good golf, you get there. So. Well, let's start with the fact it takes, you, you need a dang PhD to understand how any of these <laughs> tours It build is their field. somewhat, yes. Reshuffle is something I explain a lot as well. So yeah, like now, now if you like, when I go to Q school, top one through 45, those are all, you, you could say they're almost all conditional. They're all in a reshuffle category, meaning a third of the way they're going to look at someone who's in that category and say, okay, you've made the most money. You now go to the top of that category, meaning you're number on the priority list is better you're gonna get into more events and then they'll do that two-thirds of the way through the year again and like the men's side does it i think five or six times they do it a lot but rewarding those that are currently that, that are that are taking advantage and playing well um which great if you're playing well not you know not great if you maybe you can win q school here in december and not make a cut and pretty soon you're kind of at the bottom of the priority list again so um which is just the way it works yes yeah, so 
I want to talk about just for players to pick something up. Kim's talked a lot about how, you know, this opportunity will never be the only opportunity. I get players very frequently that I work with that say, I have one round that I care about so much in three months. It's the only tournament I care about all year. And as an instructor, I go, that's not the mentality that's going to allow you to play no. your best golf. <laughs> if you're putting yeah, all your not great. one basket, um, you're putting so much extra stress on yourself for that round, you'd be much better off almost treating it like it's one of a number of rounds that you're going to be playing, taking a more long-term approach at it. And, and I think that's something, you know, you've probably had to learn a bunch of times in your career and you're continuing to learn. And I, I think the mentality that you described going into this year's Q school is, is basically perfect. Yeah. I mean, like you say, I mean, obviously we'd be, you know, a little naive to say if there aren't more rounds that are obviously more important, like Q school for me, or maybe students going to do the mid -AM qualifier, but at the end of the day, there's a mid -AM qualifier next year, mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean? Like, or, or maybe they don't win, they don't qualify for the mid -AM, but they, and they go, man, that was pretty fun too. But the minute you put it as a on, a on a pedestal, more than likely you're going to be out there either striving for birdies or resisting bogey. Perfect. So when going to try to play, you know, your best golf, approaching around, what type of expectations are you going in with, if any? So, like, I'll I'll talk about like, you know, I had a really good second stage of Q school, and I did something there I have tried to do before, but. I had in a long time and, you know, everyone talks about, you hear this in all of sports all the time, like all oh, the process, the process, but most people, I don't think really knows what, know what that means and know how hard that is. So my goal, my expectation around to second stage was like truly simple. Like I'm going to shot the best I can, but with that came, I never looked at the leaderboard for four days, slept on it. I didn't look at my tea time. I had my caddy, my husband looked at my tea time. I, I did not want to know. And let me tell you, that's really difficult. But I stood up in every shot and I just, I reminded myself over and over, like, how can I hit the shot in front of me the best I can right now? That sounds super easy to sit here and to, and to listen to it or say it, but to do that is incredibly difficult. So like my expectation, we have six straight rounds is to do that same thing next week. I'm not going to ask them what they shot. I'm not going to ask any friends what they shot. I'm not going to look at my score. And it takes a lot. That last day for that final round at second stage. No, I mean, like, I'm not dumb. I knew I was playing well. But I thought, oh, maybe I can look tonight. It's only one arm left. But I said, no, I'm not. Because no matter how I finish, I will be so proud of myself if I do that. Because I can control that. And that's the one thing I could control was staying in the present, not looking where I was, not getting ahead of, ahead of myself and, you know, worrying about the outcome, which the minute you start thinking about the outcome, whether it's a, a shot outcome, your round, the, the tournament outcome, you're not in the present. You're not, you are not working on the process, which we all want to throw around. It's, you know, it's, it's thrown around so much. And I just think people don't really know what it means or realize how hard it is. So my expectation is to go and try to stay in the present and truly just focus on the process. That's amazing. I think that so many players would be better served by going into a round leaving with the goal of being proud of your process rather than proud of the score because if your process is rock solid you're going to get the most out of your round from a score perspective yeah and, um, and like maybe not every time but in the long run you are as we talked about like over the journey like i mean i still had i mean around a cue school i shot even par and i did not play good i was lucky to shoot even but i thought if i would have got caught up suddenly knowing i was t27 to start and now i'm probably t49 i would have probably went haywire but I just kept with it. I just kept with it. But that's also, like I say, but that's taken me years. I mean, that's taken me, I started working on a mental coach probably three years ago. And I'll never forget, our, we had our first conversation and it was like, I'm gonna try to do these couple things in the golf course. I'm like, this is gonna be great. This is gonna change my life. It's gonna be so easy. And then I played my tournament round and came back to her and I said, I didn't do one thing. Not one time did my brain go where I was supposed to go. It just all went like right out the window because it's, it's super difficult. You are literally retraining your mind. Well, and this is, and you've played what, seven full years on the LPGA tour. Yeah. I mean, about right? seven full years, I've, and I've played since I was four years old. I mean, it's like, it's unbelievable yet you're still learning and it's so hard, which is part of what you love about golf and part of what's probably so frustrating, but um, yeah, it is. It's incredibly difficult. So let's talk about those seven years on tour. I mean, 
I've been fortunate enough, I've caddied in three tour events or four maybe. And after every week, I, as a caddy, as a like a young in shape guy, I like to think I'm beat, I'm dead. I need three days in bed. How are you doing that all year long? Yeah, I would say when I was like, I, you know, I, I first ran LPJ, I think I was 22 and I thought everything was just so much fun and we were traveling, you know, the LPJ especially just goes all around the world. You know, we were doing Asia and we were doing Europe and I thought it was a blast. And I think, I know at one time I did eight events in a row, which probably wasn't my best uh, decision, but I think you just have a lot of like adrenaline, a lot of energy, but I also was, I mean, I was also I wasn't the girl that was like going out late at night either. Like I rusted, I, you know, I, I sleep well on the road, which is good. Um, but I will say as you get older or like, you know, I'm now I'm playing Epson a little more now and I've pushed my own car. You don't have to have a caddy and like, Holy cow. Like we put it in Utah this year in Salt Lake. And I thought I'm not going to make it up this hill. This one's going to be a little bit harder to splice together than our other ones. We back? I'm back. I don't oh, know where okay. you lost me, but <laughs> Utah. <laughs> okay. So I was going to say, then this year, you know, we played in Utah and I, and I pushed my own car a lot on Epson. You don't have, to have a caddy and we were at elevation and I, I, I didn't know if I was going to make it up. The, like we pretty much go up into the mountain and then down the mountain. And I was like, holy cow, like 22 to 32 is, is much different. I, I will say that it, it is much different. There's times I thought, man, I, I do need to hire myself a cat. You, you can come out to the Epson tour. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta get back hey, on the great, road. Let me tell you. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, anytime. Um, <laughs> so you you played for a long stretch on the LPGA tour and, and you you were pretty popular out there when I caddied for you early this year in LPGA tour event and you were like everyone's older sister coming back. <laughs> What, what does that do for your desire to get back to um, the top level? Yeah, you know, yeah, you, you did catch for in Hawaii and it been for a year plus since I played an LPGA event. And it was, it was so fun to go back and see so many of my friends. And it was, I, you know, I called my husband and I said, you know, I mean, I didn't play great, but it was really inspiring. I needed that a bit because sometimes you can, you can be down an absent bed or feel like it's so out of reach or, you know, I don't know it is but it was just it was it was like an inspiring week that was it kind of you know re-energized me a bit to be like hey here we go like this is where I think I belong or or, or where I want to be um so it was, a, it was a great week and it really did kind of re-spark my desire to keep at it it has been a, it's been a tough few years and you can start to think man like I could do a lot of other things and, <laughs> and make some money <laughs> because right now I'm not making any money but you know I but I love golf and I, and I think I can I can go back out there so um yeah, you need that sometimes. You need a little bit of uh, motivation. So when you're playing well versus when you're not playing as well as you'd like, does your approach change? I've had conversations about this. I think sometimes it does change, but it probably shouldn't. I, sometimes I found myself when I was at my worst practicing so much, but in reality, I, I probably should have maybe stepped away or, or walked away or, or just said, you know, I, I was probably practicing harder, not smarter, you know, what do I really need to fix? What's really going on? But that's hard. That's hard to do in the moment you're, you're out there and you're flailing and you're, and you're losing your car and you're losing your game. And, you know, everyone or people often think, oh, they're playing out working at, no, we're working so hard at it. Um, but it's just not working. It's, you know, I'm not doing the, uh, the correct things, whether it's in your golf swing or I mean, it's mentally, but, um, so my advice to people would probably be, you know, look at it, assess it. Do you need to you know, make a swing change. You need to, you know, look at maybe a club, fit, what, whatever it is, but your approach generally should have been the same. And I think at times I worked, I, I did too much, too hard, didn't give myself a break. And it was, that's when it really became work. Mm -hmm. So when you are working on your swing, you were doing a lot of swing work earlier this year when I was with you. This building that process, is it something you stick with if you believe in it? Do you wait for the the clicks like how do you know that you're making the right that's, decision man I, that's a great question <laughs> you don't know and that's that is what's really hard yeah like I felt like I needed you know to work on my golf swing and I would I'm someone like say if I go to a lesson you say do this I will stand there and do that until you know my hands bleed like almost almost to a fault and I would do that and I would do that and but I finally had this moment 
this year. And I said, I need, I'm listening to everyone. And I am trying so hard to believe in what they're saying. Various coaches I had seen, but I'm not listening to myself because in my gut, I know this isn't right. Because when it is right at this level, I would say it clicks pretty quickly. And I've had that conversation a few times um, with fellow players, like with my husband. It, it, it's going it, to, we're not starting at scratch. We're not a 10 year old that's trying to learn to, you know, whatever. So that is what I have learned. If you're doing something and someone says it's going to take months, it's probably not the right thing, not at this level. So I started listening to myself. I just kind of went out on my own a little bit and it clicked actually quite quickly. Yeah. Well, but it's hard to know. It's hard to know that you don't know that that's, that's a really great question. Cause it's a, it's a, you're questioning yourself while you say, you don't want a person just quits and gives up and you go, well, man, I would have stuck with that for four more months. But like I said, I, 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 I believe at this level, generally, you're going to see something happen pretty quickly if you're doing the right thing. Well, you know, your body so well, obviously as an elite athlete, you have great body control. I mean, when every time we've played, it's just like, she's a machine off the tee. Um, and when, when that's not, it has to be jarring. And then of course, difficult to difficult to trust as well. Um, yeah. but obviously it's been fun to watch, um, your game just get better and better as the year has gone on. And, you know, hopefully we're peaking at the right time. Hopefully we hope that. Yeah, I agree. We, uh, especially in this fall, we started to see it, um, really come up and then, you know, you have a, like I played really great well in Oregon. It was the first time I felt like I was there to compete. I knew where I was hitting the ball. I putted well, and you think this is it. And then I went to like Utah and I missed the cut and I was like, I've lost it. You know, <laughs> it's up and down. It's always an ebb and a flow, but you know, it was good for me too. And generally we had to still work out some kinks, but, um, yeah, you want to peak at the right time, obviously, but that's also what's good about six rounds. You're probably going to have a tough round in there. You hopefully have a couple couple of great rounds in there, but, uh, you know, as we say, we want to peak, but as we, you know, we keep saying it's just part of the journey. So, um, we'll, uh, we'll see what, see what happens. You know, I like that you mentioned that going into Q school, sort of knowing beforehand that something is going to go awry, you're going to have great moments and being able to accept that early. I was, um, catting for a good friend of ours in a Monday qualifier at the beginning of the year. And I told him before the round, he hadn't competed in a long time. I said, listen, something's going to go wrong out there. Let's yeah. decide yeah. how we're going to react to it now. <laughs> that, that is wait so smart. Yeah. I, we always talk, my mental coach will say, um, you know, the storm's going to come and how are you going to prepare for it? Are you going to be out there flailing around or do you have your life jacket ready? Something is going to happen. Um, and for us, it's generally like, you know, just like say, can you accept it? You have to like it, but you, can you accept the shot? You just said, can you accept that you maybe made a double bogey because you got, you know, a hundred holes left. So that is, that is like high level mental coaching, mental training, but you know, like say, once again, sounds super easy, yeah. but the first time we talked about like acceptance, I went out there, didn't accept a thing. <laughs> like, like it, it really, like, I mean, it's things you have to, you have to, it, 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 we, we'll sit there and we'll do a swing drill a thousand times. You have to remind yourself mentally also a thousand times what you're supposed to do, but that's so much harder to do for some reason. It's not a tangible thing, I think, which is why it's so much harder to do. Well, yeah. And, and you and I, if, if you and I are, are struggling with something like this, every player is going to yeah. be struggling with this. It's, it amazes me, you know, even working with players, they'll, they'll find their rhythm, their groove on the range and just peer a bunch, but the golf course is not the range. It's not this no. static <laughs> environment. The, the result is there. And, you know, we place so much importance on it, whether we should or not. Um, and, you know, I see players, they hit a good first tee shot and their second shot in the green isn't perfect. And then we start to go kind of yes. downhill, abandoning the things yes. that put us in a good position um, before that. Yeah. Yeah. And like saying, we do it even at our level, we do things that, you know, you get done and we maybe, maybe we're more aware of it, but it's, um, it is, it's hard. It's really hard. I, I wish, I wish we had from a young age and there's, there's so much better now, but I, I didn't have much, you know, just where you worked on some of those really simple concepts from a young age. Cause I think you maybe take to them more as a kid than you do as an adult when you're overthinking everything and, uh, you know, just want to do everything technically. So you're uh, obviously do great coaching for them because you're well aware of it. Um, but when, as always easier said than done. Oh yeah, and I, and it, this is the stuff that this is why I love getting out and and caddying and going to tour events, um, even if it's not my job anymore, even if I'm not really benefiting that much from it, I feel like it uh, keeps me engaged in what 
um, not only you guys are going through, um, but also what my clients are going through. I had a guest on last week and we were talking about how a lot of times for an amateur, that member guest or that mm -hmm. qualifier they're getting up for all year, they feel the same things that yeah. you felt going into a US Open or you felt yeah. going into any of that. They have like no tools to deal with it. So I feel for them, you know, they're <laughs> out there with zero tools. So it's amazing that, you know, they, they make contact. Like I, I I think I have this whole toolbox that I worked on and I pay someone to help me with and they have nothing. So, um, it's hard. It's a really hard game. Yeah, no, it is. It is incredibly hard. And, and you play it at the highest level, we are going to be uh, rooting for you. Um, I, I know the LPGA doesn't always make Q school super easy to find, but if anyone wants to follow along, uh, I'm sure we can get you a link. Just, or if, you, whatever. LPGA, if you go to the LPGA, LPGA website, it should be, it should just be the only leaderboard on or the app actually. So it should yeah. be, it should be. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And go, I know none of the go. tours make it very easy to find, but <laughs> go follow Kim, make sure um, that, you know, we make sure she gets through and, uh, and, and she'll be back on the LPGA sooner than rather than later. I'm sure of it. That sounds great. We'll have Alex. You can do a podcast from the course. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you guys.